Uh, can you guys see it? Yep. Looks okay. Good. Sorry. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. Just making sure. Okay. Excellent. Um, I'll start whenever you're ready to start the timer there, Bruce. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you to the audience for taking their time to come view this unique angle of defense for the origination of the doctrine of the Trinity. As we have heard from many skeptics in the past, the Trinity doctrine is claimed to have originated only at the Council of Nicaea, and that Christians did not hold to this concept of the nature of God prior to this council. The claim is that the Trinity is some form of extra-Christian construct that is actually not biblical or valid. Allow me to take you on a little journey through time to show you how blatantly false this idea actually is. Um, to start, we'll begin with against Arius and how we know the church believed the Trinity prior to the Council of Nicaea. This is one of the simpler arguments in support of the origin of the Trinity preceding Nicaea and has very much to do with the nature of the Council itself. A brief reminder that the only reason this Council was convened was to answer the Alexandrian heretic Arius that was preaching against the divinity of Christ, proclaiming him to be a created being and not actually God. The answer to this was the entire of the Christian theological world convening to denounce this heresy and compose the Nicene Creed. Why was the church response so magnanimous and easily consented against Arius? Why was the rest of the theological world able to come to swift agreement against Arius and compose the Nicene Creed in unanimous agreement with each other? Well, the answer is simple, because they all already believed in what the creed said before it was written. The very fact that the entire theologically scholarly world was able to swiftly agree unanimously with this core creed against the heretic Arius is incredible evidence that this concept was widely believed and accepted by nearly all of third century Christianity before this creed was even considered to be written. While not dogmatically expressed in a definitive fashion, the triunity of God was believed in the hearts of the Christians of the church and the scholars who taught them. If not, why wasn't there massive debate over multiple different theories about the nature of God? Why was it just Arius versus the world? Well, because Christianity had already accepted and was already believing what the council simply defined in writing. We'll take a step further back in time and find out when the first time the word Trinity was used by who and how was it used. The anti-Trinitarian position becomes a bit more laughable as we step to our next argument and just simply further, just slightly further back in time. If the claim is that the Trinity was created at Nicaea, this begs the question, why wasn't the word Trinity used in the Nicene Creed? The word Trinity doesn't actually appear in the Nicene Creed. Despite this fact, all Christians, and even my non-Christian opposition, accept that this creed is a statement of the triune nature of God in both his distinctiveness and unity. To find the first mention of the word Trinity, you actually have to go back about a hundred years before the Council of Nicaea would convene with the writings of Tertullian in his letter against Praxius. Tertullian against Praxius writes, while the mystery of the dispensation is still guarded, which distributes the unity into a trinity, placing in their order the three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Here we see that near a century prior to the Nicene Council, there is a fully flushed out concept of the Trinity presented boldly and proudly as a statement against a pre-Aryan heretic attacking the deity of Christ. This alone shows that the wording and the concept of the Trinity is definitively pre-existent to the Council of Nicaea, and therefore defeating my opposition's opening position, but it is helpful for the audience to take a couple steps back further still and see how the triunity essence of God was still preserved and held true by early believers. In the first and second century Christianity, starting with the church fathers Clement of Rome and Ignatius, there's not really a controversial statement to say that the early church fathers were not really contending with attacks or heresies against the nature of God, as the latter, later apologists of the third century would have to contend. Since this is the case, there's not much written in specific defenses of the nature of God or the divinity of Christ. It would be the eventual heresies that would catalyze the church scholars of the of the day to finally make a more definitive statement in defense of the nature of God as revealed in scripture. Nonetheless, we do see the church fathers still maintaining a triadic structure in many of their writings when they speak of God. Uh, Clement of Rome writes in 1 Clement around 95 AD, do we not have one God? 
and one Christ, and one Spirit of grace, which was poured out upon us, and also writes, For as God lives, and as the Holy Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Ghost live. In his letter to the Ephesians, Ignatius clearly calls Christ God. He refers to the Father's plan of sending his Son, who is both of man and of God, and he refers to the Holy Spirit's work in the incarnation of Christ. He writes, For our God, Jesus the Christ, was conceived by Mary, according to God's plan, both from the seed of David and of the Holy Spirit. He also writes in his letter to the Magnesians, Be eager, therefore, and be firmly grounded in the precepts of the Lord and the apostles, in order that in whatever you do, you may prosper physically and spiritually in faith and love in the Son and the Father and in the Holy Spirit. Even church fathers seem to carry a near profound understanding of the triune nature of God, but simply had not been catalyzed to fully flush out the idea by the heretical challenges that would emerge in the future. Nonetheless, just because it isn't explicitly, sta explicitly stated doesn't mean it wasn't there in some form. Slightly further back in time, we still see early Christians using a triadic structure in their reference and worship of God. This is seen clearly in the Didache, uh, which is the writing of the apostles, I'm sorry, writing of the disciples of the apostles or those that followed the apostles. Um, and it says there are, um, sorry, there are multiple references in the Didache that show that the earliest Christians recognized and respected a triune essence of God as had been taught to them clearly from the scripture. Here are a few of the statements contained therein. But with respect to baptism, baptize as follows, having said all things in advance, baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in running water. But if you do not have running water, baptize in some other water, and if you cannot baptize in cold water, use warm. But if you have neither, pour water on the head three times, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Continuing on in another section, but concerning the Eucharist, you shall give thanks as follows. First, with respect to the cup, we thank you, our Father, for the holy vine of David, your child, which you have made known to us, uh, made known unto us through Jesus, your child. To you be the glory forever. And concerning the broken bread, we thank you, our Father, for the life and knowledge which you have made known unto us through Jesus, your child. To you be the glory forever. As this broken bread was once scattered on the mountains, and after it had been brought together, became one, so may your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For the glory and power is yours through Jesus Christ forever. And let none eat or drink of your Eucharist unless they have been baptized into the name of the Lord. For also the Lord has said about this, do not give what is holy to the dogs. This makes it fairly easy for me to see that even the earliest Christians respected the dis distinctiveness and unity of God at the same time, even though none had yet been instigated to give a full doctrinal statement on the concept, such as the nature of many topics clarified by the body of Christ over time. It seems very clear here that while the writers of the DDK recognize the distinctiveness of the Father and the Son, they also recognize them both as God. And the final step back, which is the two powers in heaven heresy and our conclusion. What many may not know is that we can actually take a step back before even Christ had come to this earth to find a proto-Trinitarian concept in Second Temple Judaism. Alan F. Siegel wrote a very in-depth book on this topic and explored a heresy that emerged in Judaism prior to Christ being born. Jews during the Second Temple period were struggling with reconciling verses in scripture that seem that seemed to clearly point to two Yahweh. Yahweh's. In response to this, the two powers in heaven heresy emerged, which taught that Yahweh was actually a duality, not a duality in the sense of the Zoroastrian deity of one evil God and one good God, but two Yahweh's, both of them good and both of them God. This was a very controversial topic and was making it difficult to rationalize the one and many essence of God being presented by this doctrine, but shows that even prior to Christ's birth, uh, theological minds were noticing and attempting to philosophically tackle the complex paradoxical nature of God as revealed in scripture. If you would like to learn more about this topic, I recommend getting the book from Alan Siegel with the caveat that I will, ver that I will verify that it is extremely dry reading. For those who don't prefer this venture, I recommend searching Michael Heiser's Unseen Realm seminar where he dedicates a good amount of time discussing the details of this doctrine in Judaism. In conclusion, just because we don't see explicit teachings and declarations 
concentrations on the Trinity prior to Nicaea doesn't mean that early Christians didn't still hold to the triune essence of God. Uh, by Tertullian alone, we can see clearly that the very definition and use of the word Trinity predates the Council of Nicaea near a hundred years. The fact the Council of Nicaea so easily and magnanimously agreed with the creed with no other contentions or theories of the nature of God presented shows that the very essence of the Trinity was far from controversial concept to accept for the entirety of the scholarly Christian world in the fourth century, save for a few radical fringe heretics. If we have any faith in the work of the body of Christ to instruct the truth, then there is no reason to not have faith in the doctrine of the Trinity. And with that, I will yield. Hey, very good, very good. We're right on like 10 minutes. And I actually did get a, a more updated uh, timer set. Oh, beautiful. Excellent. It's called my phone, guys. The world is advancing for my eyes. All right, whenever you're ready, Cisco. Okay, let me bring up my uh, stuff here. Okay, uh, I'm just going to jump in with my opening here. Uh, and here we go. Early Christianity was theologically diverse, although as time went on, a Catholic quote unquote movement, a bishop led developing organization, which at least from the late second century, who claimed to be the true successors of Jesus' apostles. They became increasingly dominant, out competing many Gnostic and quasi Jewish groups, still confining our attention to what scholars now call this Catholic or proto. Orthodox Christianity, it contained divergent views about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No theologian in the first three Christian centuries was a Trinitarian in the sense of a believing that the one God is tripersonal, containing equally divine persons, quote, unquote, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The terms we translate as Trinity, Latin Trinitas, Greek Trias, seem to have come into use only in the last two decades of the second century, but such usage doesn't reflect Trinitarian beliefs. These late second and third century authors use such terms not to refer to the one God, but rather to the plurality of the one God, together with his Son and his Spirit. The, they profess a trinity, triad or three, a threesome, but not a triune or tripersonal God, nor did they consider these to be equally divine. A common strategy for defending monotheism in this period is to emphasize the unique divinity of the Father. Uh, we can illustrate this with, uh, and I don't want to use uh, the Bible because we are not sure of what things were, but in our modern uh, book called John, uh, chapter 5, verse 24, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come unto condemnation, but is passed from death to life. This is, there is no Trinity there. That is Jesus talking about his father. There is no doctrine in there. It is, he is saying, you have to believe in God the father. He doesn't say, Jesus isn't saying you have to believe in him. Although other passages in the Bible and other texts uh, do say that. Uh, but in John 5, that is not apparent. Uh, the first of the early church fathers to be recorded using the word Trinity was Theophilus of Antioch, writing circa 180 AD. Theophilus's apology is most notable for being the earliest extant Christian work to use the word Trinity. In like manner also, the three days which were before, the, this is quoting uh, uh, the Theophilus, he says, in like manner also the three days which were before the luminaries are types of the Trinity of God and his word and his wisdom. And the fourth is the type of man who needs light so that there may be God, the word, wisdom, man. Uh, that is a little bit more than a Trinity, uh, but uh, he was not creating a doctrine. The first defense of the doctrine of the Trinity was in the early third century by the early church father Tertullian. Uh, Tertullian uh, was born around 160 AD, died around 215 AD, and he wrote, we define that there are two, the Father and the Son, and three with the Holy Spirit. And this number is made by the pattern of salvation, which brings about unity in Trinity 
interre interrelating the three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are three, not in dignity, but in degree, not in substance, but in form, not in power, but in kind. They are one substance and power because there is one God from whom these degrees, forms, and kinds devolve in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is not the same as the Son, since they differ from one another in the mode of their being. For the Father is the entire substance, but the Son is a derivation and portion of the whole. As he himself acknowledges, my Father is greater than I. In the psalm, his inferiority is described as being a little lower than the angels. Thus, the Father is distinct from the Son, being greater than the Son, inasmuch as he who begets is one, and he who is begotten is another. He too sends his, sends his one, and he who is sent is another. And he again who makes is one, and he through whom the thing is made is another. For who will deny that God is a body, although God is a spirit? For spirit has a bodily substance of its own kind, in its own form. Now, even if invisible things, whatsoever they be, have both their substance and their form from God, whereby they are divisible to God alone, how much more so shall that which has been sent forth from his substance not be without substance? Whatever, therefore, was the substance of the word that I designate as a quote-unquote person, I claim for it the name of his son. And while I recognize the son, I assert his distinction as second to the father. This is the formation of uh, a doctrine of the Trinity, an understanding, an explanation of the Trinity, at, uh, far removed from saying there are three things that are somehow connected, which is early Christianity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were uh, not really argued. The connections between them was varied throughout early Christianity, as we've just seen with Tertullian. Uh, Opposite of Tertullian was Oregon, who was uh, born 100, around 186 A.D., died 255 A.D., and he wrote a completely different idea, uh, wherein he writes, The God and the Father who hold the universe together is superior to every being that exists, for he imparts to each one from his own existence that which each one is. The Son being less than the Father is superior to rational creatures alone, for he is second to the Father. The Holy Spirit is still less and dwells within the saints alone, so that in this way the power of the Father is greater than that of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that of the Son is more than that of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Mark Edward writes in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy that, quote, Oregon was the first Christian to speak and write of the Trinity. Most scholars give Oregon of Alexandria credit for being the first great theologian of Christianity. Oregon's thoughts on the Trinity are braced between the Platonic philosophy of the Logos and the Trinitarian doctrine we know today. He describes the relationship of the Trinity as homeosis, which means same essence, or one essence, as one of substance between the, between the second hypostases, Jesus, and the first hypostases, the Father. In the story of the Christian theology, Olson writes of a disparity in Oregon's philosophy. The Logos, according to Oregon, is somehow less than the Father, although he never explained exactly what that means. Did Olson's research on Oregon or include on first principles? Mark Underwood explicitly states that the Son is autotheos, a separate God, as it were. The Father or first person is nevertheless the only one who is autotheos, God in the fullest sense. Whereas the Son is his dunamis, or power and the spirit, a dependent being, operative only in the elect. All there are all three are eternal and incorporeal, the Son being known as wisdom in relation to the Father, and Logos, reason, in relation to the world. Looking at on first principles, Oregon writes, the God and Father who holds the universe together is superior to every being that exists. The Son, being less than the Father, is superior to the rational creatures alone, for he is second to the Father. The Holy Spirit is still less and dwells within the saints alone. Uh, later on in first principles, uh, Oregon writes, 
that Jesus Christ himself who came into the world was born of the Father before all creatures, that after he had been the servant of the Father in the creation of all things, for by him were all things made. He in the last time, divesting himself of his glory, became a man and was incarnate, although God, and while made a man, remained the God which he was, that he assumed a body like to our own, differing in this respect only, that it was born of a virgin and of the Holy Spirit, that this Jesus Christ was truly born and did truly suffer and did not endure his death coming to man in appearance only, but did truly die, that he did truly rise from the dead, and that after his resurrection, he conversed with his disciples and was taken up into heaven. Uh, now, one of the things about Oregon is he was considered a heretic. A heretic is, is a pejorative word that everybody was throwing at everybody else. If you don't agree with me, you're a heretic. Well, you don't agree with me, that makes you a heretic. It's a nonsense word, basically. But uh, onwards, uh, on French Principles 2, 1, on Christ, uh, Oregon writes, According to John, uh, God is light, the only begotten Son, therefore is the glory of this light, proceeding inseparably from God himself, as brightness does from light, and illuminating the whole of creation. For agreeably to what we have already explained as to the manner in which he is the way, and conducts, conducts to the Father, and in which he is the Word, interpreting the secrets of wisdom and the mysteries of knowledge, making them known to the rational creation, and is also the truth and the life and the resurrection. In the same way ought we to understand also the meaning of his being the brightness, for it is by his splendor that we understand and feel what light is itself. Oregon seemed to be able to distinguish between the various ways, this is an aside, Oregon seemed to be able to distinguish between the various ways angel or messenger is used in the Bible as a title or designation and the idea of Christ having an angelic nature. That's a big clue right there. Oregon sometimes refers to angels in the Bible as Christ or the Holy Spirit, but does not require of Oregon a belief in the angel Christology. Uh, And later on, uh, since Oregon mentions John, Tertullian doesn't mention any of the Gospels. Uh, and Tertullian has a completely different concept of the Trinity than Oregon. That's why I'm using I'm just take quick oh. about, about 30 seconds left. If we're holding to the, uh, the 12 minutes, or how long do you guys want to how do you want to do this? I don't want to get. I, I would prefer him to, to wrap it up. He's already way diverged on things he said he wasn't going to. No, I, I just want to keep it. I'm uh, not diverging at all, and you need to shut up. You, you, you said it wasn't theology. Long. You said it wasn't theology, and then you keep bringing up. Not Bible my theology, it's to, the history. Smokey, are you stupid? Why don't you shut theology. up and stop talking over it? Well, go ahead. Um, wait, this is why wait, I hate to doing we're this not because no debating theology, but then he keeps lie. bringing up verses about theology oh, about whether or not the Smoky, Bible you're teaches. a liar and a moron, and you just wait, proved hold it. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to Boy, the fuse on that <laughs> Asperger's is pretty your short. <laughs> with your oh, oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait. Wait. <laughs> we have like 30 seconds to a minute. We're getting. Cisco, would that be? Would that be I mean, like, is he done yet? Can we, can he like finish? Yeah. I mean, what? No, I'm just asking. I mean, I mean, come on, dude. Like, he left in my comments. By the way, just so you know, Bruce, he left in my comments. Just remember, Smokey, this is not a theology debate. This is a history debate. And I'm like, okay, okay well, well, it's a history of theology, but all right. So I didn't prep okay. theology. Do you are rebuttal, Smokey? Are you deaf? And then he's reading well, the Bible well, 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 and saying well, that the well, Bible well, teaches well, his version of whatever he believes about God, and now he's dragging well, that well, into the debate. So what that. should I do? Right, right. I, okay, okay. No, I mean, I, I think I won with Tertullian. He already, he already conceded with Tertullian oh, in his own opening. Of, I don't know what else of, to do. Uh, wait a minute. Instead of fighting over this, oh, sorry, let's just the move history on. Let's just of move on. the doctrines of the Trinity, and I was using those to point out the historical wow. record that wow. you do not understand. It is, it is, it is a tragedy it's to, to have to know you personally, sir. You're a tragedy, Loki. You're wait. a moron. 
Cisco, could you just finish? Could you go like, you know, like I'm a, done. Like, I told him to do his rebuttal. Okay, okay let's okay, get okay, started. Okay. Go ahead, then, Smokey. Go ahead. All right. He said that no one prior to Nicaea had the idea of God as three. I persons. did not say that, you liar. Um, well, hold on. We got to. I could rewind. I, am I allowed to rebut, or is he going to spurg right. now? Is that yeah, what how this long is? is the Let's get this worked out. Is it five minutes? <laughs> how long do you want? To I, I think I need probably about uh, six or seven minutes, roughly. Okay, and what's um, good for you, uh, for you, DB? What's good for you for a rebuttal? What do you think is fair to you? I think it should be equal. I don't know why you're asking okay. him. Do you, do you want somewhere like around five to, to seven minutes or something like that, DB? When he's done. Yeah, I don't need much. Okay, okay, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> That's for sure. Go ahead, go All right, ahead. let's move on. Okay, so he did say at the beginning, you guys can rewind it and re-listen to the tape because apparently he's going to lie about it, or he's just isn't doesn't possess okay, the mental well, faculties to remember. Wrong, so but what, Bruce, you have point. to let me talk, dude. Just let me speak. Just let me have my rebuttal okay, period. He can say I'm whatever he wants. Out. Okay. He said that no one prior to Nicaea had the idea of God as three persons. And, of course, if he wasn't having an autistic fit, he would have let me finish the sentence. And remember, that is exactly what he said at the beginning of his statement. He said that no one held that as three persons. However, I went and pulled up the quote from Tertullian, where Tertullian, 100 years prior, specifically states persons. And, in fact, it's funny how incredibly, disgustingly dishonest he's willing to be when he goes back and quotes Tertullian himself and yet ignores to skip over the portion of the quote where he does definitively state the essence of persons, which, by the way, is in that same section in his letter against praxis. Um, I believe it's in chapter two towards the end, or section two towards the end. You guys can go read it yourself and see what he conveniently clipped out in his uh, opening to try and make his case, which is false and completely blatantly false because Tertullian did state it. Um, he uh, assumes the full philosophy of their position without them stating it. This means that he's basically going to vague statements of early church fathers that we're not specifically commenting on the nature of God or responding to anyone that was challenging the nature of God, and therefore we're not providing fully flushed out philosophical statements as to the nature of God, but simply we're stating their understanding of the essence of the triunity of God as they understood it. They may, may very well have held to a perspective of a multi-personal um, idea of God. And by the way, if they were Greek uh, uh, readers and if they were translating from the Greek, I believe that they would have been able to pull that from the text itself via application of the Granville Sharp Rule, which is a standard uh, usage of phraseology, which we can discuss if he ultimately wants to. Um, but that would be my answer, uh, which we'll unhash at the after show, because again, he said this isn't a theological debate, and I'll save it for the after show that so we can go through it, and then I'm not wasting time in my rebuttal. Um, he claims there is no doctrine of Trinity in the scripture, and he also said this was not a theology topic, and then he goes into scripture and pulls up verses. I think that's pure failure. Um, he goes to Tertullian, but he neglects to uh, quote the part where the person exists in the differentiation of his statement. Uh, he talks about origin, but oddly enough, he ends up validating the philosophical concept of the Logos that was not only presented by Origen, but was also unhashed by Philo, who was a Jewish philosopher who was incorporating the idea of the Logos and the presentation of the nature and essence of God. Um, and also, uh, and that was around 50 AD, by the way, so this is very soon um, after the death of Christ. Um, and this, there was also uh, Ignatius, uh, where the philosophical concept of the Trinity by the Logos was also uh, being heavily flushed out, or the essence of of Christ as the word of God being forever begotten or eternally begotten um, of the Father that the Son was was given. Uh, so uh, there is this idea presented even in early Christian concepts, although simply not delineated, as would be essential later on at the Council of Nicaea in order to answer the heretics. Um, heretic doesn't really mean what he said it is. He's just making it sound like it's this thing that was thrown around everywhere in the early church. It wasn't. It had a very specific meaning, and it was a very specific judgment about someone who actually deviated from core essential doctrines of the universal faith at the time. Um, and most scholars don't usually have an issue unless they're a complete deviant. Uh, don't actually have an issue with claiming that um, doctrinal precepts and presentations um, in the first four or five hundred years of Christianity were fairly sound. Um, with, of course, the exception of some of the fringes and certainly Origen had some uh, interesting deviances from what the rest of Christianity would have presented about the nature of God and some other beliefs. Um, let's see, is there anything else? Uh, no, I think that'll conclude it. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Done with my rebuttal. I'll yield. There we go. Thanks. Um, you ready, DB? 
I'm ready. Okay, okay. Go ahead, whenever you're ready. Okay. First, I never said they did not have or use the term person or persona, uh, which makes Smokey dishonest right from the beginning. I am not debating theology. I presented two different theologies as history of the ideas regarding the Trinity. I never said that the that a uh, concept of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost did not exist prior to Nicaea. That's another lie. I said that there was no formal doctrine, that it had been argued up beginning in the late second century, as I pointed out with uh, 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 Tertullian and Oregon. So, and Smokies has no understanding of what the term heresy meant. He is totally off base. He is pushing his own beliefs, his own theology. He has no clue of what history means. He is pushing theology and nothing more. Uh, and I'm, I'm done with my rebuttal. I, I don't try to teach pigs to sing. Yeah, laugh, Smokey. Yeah, laugh over me. Start insulting me. Oh, so I'm so done. it's good. I'm done too. This was everything I hoped it would be. Thank you for this, Bruce. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have yourself a pleasant night. Talk to you guys later.